afternoon, depending on your, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Abby Evans. I'm the Senior Director for Government Relations at Mentor. Uh, we're a national nonprofit that support the mentoring movement across the country. Um, I am a white woman with dark curly hair. Today I'm wearing a black top um, and I'm sitting in my office in Washington, DC in front of a, a white background. And you can see a bit of uh, the window in my office off to the side. Um, today, uh, our event um, is really exciting and chock full of really, really impressive uh, speakers. And our event is sponsored by Mentor, the Partners for Youth with Disabilities, the American Association of People with Disabilities. And we're doing this event, uh, event in conjunction with Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus and the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus. Um, and we're so grateful uh, for their support today. And just a few housekeeping items before we jump right into this amazing event. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and shared with all registrants, as well as any materials um, that might be addressed or come up as part of today's presentation. Um, uh, you are invited and welcome to submit questions throughout the presentation. As I've already said, we have a chock full agenda. We will try our best to get to questions. If not, we'll make sure those are addressed in responses after the event. Um, and uh, again, to uh, make things a little more efficient today, we sent out the uh, biographies and headshots of every speaker for today via email before the event. Um, you should have received that. We will make sure that's included after the event as well in case that got misplaced in your inbox. Um, uh, but we're gonna jump right into our uh, event. And today I have the pleasure of introducing um, the CEO of Mentor, David Shapiro. Thanks, Abby. Uh, I'm David Shapiro. As Abby said, uh, I have the pleasure and privilege of being the CEO of Mentor. Uh, I am a white man with curly brown hair um, sitting in our office here in Boston, Massachusetts, with actually some people behind me, uh, which is a rare treat these days in terms of some of us being able to be in spaces together. Um, and uh, when they talked about describing yourself, I thought my mom always described me as husky, which was kind, uh, but I'll take it. And uh, and so I am just uh, very pleased uh, to be with you all. As I thought about uh, today, um, maybe I always come back to the same thing, which is relationships and the company you keep. And um, we feel so lucky uh, to be in this company. Um, it is how we bring our best. Um, I think about a 20-year relationship with Regina Snowden and Partners for Youth with Disabilities and their leadership uh, and vision in merging these two worlds and working to both show uh, and influence how we make this movement uh, as inclusive and vibrant uh, as it can possibly be. Um, and then their introduction to NDMC, the National Disability Mentoring Council and Derek, um, and then the further introduction to the American Association for People with Disabilities. Um, and it has taken all those connection points uh, for us to get to this place and bring our best, uh, not unlike the connections that we all need uh, to make our way and to bring our best. And so that's really at the heart of mentoring. Um, also at the heart of mentor and mentoring um, is the best uh, caucus chair that an organization could ever and a movement could ever ask for um, in Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon, who has um, a, just been a tour de force uh, in, in the chairship of of the caucus so far uh, in bringing issue uh, and elevating the mentoring movement and our need for connection. Um, also, uh, Representative Jim Langevin and Representative Don Young and the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus. So it really takes us all, right? It takes us all uh, to build a movement, to build a field, uh, to break up systemic challenges, uh, to instead of thinking about the number of seats at the table, to make sure everyone has not only a seat at the table, uh, but feels that they could sit at the head of the table. Uh, they could write the menu, uh, they could make the meal, uh, that they have the purpose and belonging, thriving and striving uh, to be the folks they, they want to be in this world and can be. Um, this is the universality of human connection. Uh, our enemy is isolation. Um, and we recognized uh, very early because of Regina and her visionary leadership and the example of Partners for Youth with Disabilities uh, that 
there was going to have to be extra effort to bring the mentoring field and mentoring movement to further understanding of different abilities, of inclusivity, um, of how to make their programs uh, the most vibrant and inclusive places. And that's that's all we've tried to do is merge our friends, merge our experts, merge our visionaries uh, so that we can learn from each other. Um, most recently, uh, with the support of the Millbank Foundation, uh, Mentor and PYD in collaboration with NDMC have launched an initiative to try to infuse practices to make us more intentional um, around train through training and support and public awareness, training organizations, building coalition, uh, creating a six week learning cohort for mentoring professionals around how to make their programs as inclusive as possible. This webinar today, our National Mentoring Summit is also a reflection of our own organization's learnings, which are never done in trying to get better and better at making sure this movement and field serves, is representative, and is informed by all members of our population, all ages, all backgrounds, all abilities. We have to have a seat at the table for everybody to be the best we can be if we're gonna be in the human connection business. Um, we will continue to work forward on that. I would thank you. Uh, we often say in mentoring, you express your values by the way you spend your time. You're here today. Uh, that means you want to be a part of this movement. That means you want to continuously improve. That means you know inclusivity uh, is learned and something that we can only keep getting better at. And it's only something that's as big as our exposure, horizons, our willingness to learn, our humility, uh, and, and our dedication to just being better, better at this work better at making more folks feel included uh, and better at being informed uh, by all those around us. So we'll keep working on that. We are proud to have you as a part of this movement, as a part of this coalition. We hope you'll plug in uh, to the coalition, to the trainings uh, and to the advocacy and policy around things like the, the Foster Youth Mentoring Act, Mentoring to Succeed Act uh, and the Youth Mentoring Grant. Um, and I would just thank everybody who brings us here today uh, and pass uh, the torch uh, back to Abby, uh, and I'm grateful, obviously, to to Caden and Abby, my colleagues at Mentor, uh, who always help us all and the movement and field show up uh, at our best. So thank you to everybody so much. Wonderful. This is Abby again. Thank you so much, David. I was really struck by something you said, the enemy is isolation, and I think that is so relevant to today's conversation. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Representative Mary Gay Scanlon. Um, she is a champion, a true champion for youth mentoring on Capitol Hill and in her personal life. She is also the chair of the Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus, uh, which is why she is here with us today. We're so pleased. Um, and she's a uh, representative from the great state of Pennsylvania, where I am from. Um, and so uh, 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 Rep Scanlon, thank you so much for joining us today and I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I understand we're supposed to introduce ourselves um, as we appear as well. And so I am, I was going to say middle-aged, but in fact, I'm 61. So I'm not sure if that counts, but I'm a white woman with medium length, blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm wearing a purple dress and sitting in my office in front of an American and a Pennsylvania flag. And I also have on glasses so I can see what's going on on the computer. So thank you, mentor. Partners for Youth with Disabilities, the National Disability Mentoring Coalition, the American Association of People with Disabilities, and all of our panelists for your support in pulling together this briefing today. I also want to thank the leaders of the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus, Congressman Langevin and Congressman Young, for partnering with the Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus on this important issue. You know, for almost a decade, I was an attorney at the Education Law Center in Pennsylvania where the majority of our work was to enforce the rights of students with disabilities under federal special education laws. Um, I was appointed and served on a statewide task force to promote best practices and implementation of the transition requirements of the IDEA. And I think that's, that's relevant to what we're talking about today. From that work and work I've done since, I know that young people with disabilities face unique challenges. But I also know that with appropriate accommodations or interventions, they can have great success in education and throughout their transition to adult life. Um, I also know that uh, many youth with disabilities um, get swept up in our criminal justice system and that mentoring can be a powerful tool to disrupt that school to prison pipeline. 
So I really want to lean into the idea that we can use the IDEA to um, implement mentoring interventions as a powerful tool. We can incorporate mentoring into a student's IEP, and then it becomes mandatory. We can enforce it. So this is a, you know, especially good for older students as they move out of high school, consider post-secondary education, career goals, and learning how to advocate for themselves. You know, how great is a mentor in helping um, young people learn how to advocate for themselves? We know from the research, mentoring is evidence-based. It's a strategy that can help young people prepare for employment, independent living, adulthood. And given its positive results, we need to ensure that young people with disabilities can use it as a tool and that mentoring programs are available and accessible. One way to do this is by investing in a national paid peer mentoring workforce that can connect students to mentors with similar life experiences and provide employment opportunities for young adults with disabilities. I know firsthand how beneficial mentoring relationships can be for the mentor as well. Um, peer mentoring relationships can give young people with disabilities um, opportunities um, to, to be a positive role model and to help them build their skill sets in leadership and problem solving. In our increasingly virtual world, we also need to expand accessible e-mentoring opportunities to students with disabilities as they work to overcome the learning loss and isolation of the past year. Mentoring programs do such great work in my district and across the country to help young people navigate their way through today's challenges, but they can't do it alone. Uh, the Department of Justice's Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the National Mentoring Resource Center, offer support and technical assistance to improve the quality and effectiveness of mentoring programs. And of course, um, one of the, the former heads of that office works in, in Philadelphia and has been a long time supporter of, of youth efforts. Um, Bob Listenby, who was with the Defenders Association and then headed up the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, so we can build upon the great work that that National Mentoring Resource Center can do by ensuring that its work includes technical insistence for incorporating inclusivity and accessibility into mentoring programs. Doing this will help connect more youth with disabilities to mentors who can positively impact their lives, but we're going to need additional investment to do that. OJJTP has long supported mentoring and over the years has distributed millions of dollars in grants to programs across the country via the Youth Mentoring Grant. I was happy to join my colleague, Congressman Langevin, in calling for increased funding for OJJDP's Youth Mentoring Grant for the next fiscal year. And I'm happy to report that the FY22 funding bill contains a $10 million increase in the program from last year. Proud to say that mentoring has broad bipartisan support in Capitol Hill, and we're gonna to try to keep that front and center before our colleagues. I hope that all of my colleagues will join me on the Youth Mentoring Caucus and work to bring additional resources to our nation's mentoring programs and young people. So thank you again, everyone, for being here. And I'm looking forward to a great conversation with our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Scanlon. So appreciate your time this morning. Um, now we're going to transition to uh, sharing with you all two pre-recorded uh, remarks from uh, other members of Congress. First up is Representative Jim Langevin. We've heard his name a couple of times already this morning. He is from Rhode Island. Um, he is the co-chair of the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus. Uh, Rep, uh, in this video, you'll see in a moment, Rep Langevin is sitting in his wheelchair. He's wearing a Navy suit with a light blue shirt and a red tie. He's seated in front of the Congressional Seal, um, which is right behind him, as well as an American flag. Hi, I'm Congressman Jim Langevin. Thank you for joining the Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus and the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus for this important briefing. We know that mentoring programs are a crucial resource for young people, particularly those who are low income, academically at risk, or members of otherwise disadvantaged communities, including young people with disabilities. Mentorship puts kids on a path to success by promoting positive social and behavioral development. Disadvantaged young people who meet regularly with mentors are 52% less likely to skip class, 55% more likely to plan to go to college, and 130% more likely to hold a leadership position. These evidence-based programs level the playing field and help youth build foundations for success in adulthood. 
I know firsthand the importance of having a mentor. There are many people in my life that I consider mentors who stoked my interest in politics and taught me what it means to be a public servant. I'm lucky enough to count among my mentors former Mayor Joe Walsh and former Mayor Frank Flaherty, two brilliant mayors of my hometown of Warwick, Rhode Island. I'm also lucky to have Senator Claiborne Pell as a mentor, for whom I learned, uh, interned with, and later joined as a colleague in government when I became Secretary of State. Working on the mayoral campaigns of Joe and Frank were my earliest forays into electoral politics. Both men encouraged my passion and served as valuable role models when I ran to be a delegate in the Rhode Island Constitutional Convention in 1986 and later campaigned to represent my hometown of Warwick in the State House. Senator Pell was the consummate statesman. He didn't care about who got credit. He only cared about serving his constituents and getting the job done. To this day, I model my approach to public service on the principles that I learned from him. Now, it's not an exaggeration to say that without these mentors, I would not be where I am today. And the unfortunate reality is that too many young people with disabilities are less likely than non-disabled youth to have good education and good workplace outcomes. In fact, people with disabilities attend post-secondary education at a significantly lower rate than people without disabilities, and the labor force participation rate for people with disabilities is less than half the rate for people without disabilities. So these are not encouraging statistics for disabled youth. But fortunately, mentorship can help young people with disabilities overcome many of these challenges. Through mentorship, youth with disabilities are more likely to display improved academic performance, higher college uh, enrollment rates, and increased career awareness. Sadly, mentorship, though, is out of reach for many young people. Mentor estimates that 16 million youth in the United States are growing up without a mentor of any kind. Mentor has also found that most disadvantaged youth are less likely to connect with an uh, informal mentor, and this includes young people with disabilities. Lack of demand is not the cause of the mentorship gap. In fact, the average mentorship program has 63 young people on its wait list. Clearly, more resources are necessary to ensure that equitable access to mentoring services are there. Thankfully, youth mentorship is one area that can boast bipartisan support in Congress. In April, I was proud to lead an appropriations letter with my good friend and colleague, Congressman Randy Feenstra, uh, in support of youth mentoring grants at the Department of Justice. This grant program funds evidence-based mentoring services for at-risk and underserved youth so that they have uh, the supports that they need to thrive academically, personally, and professionally. As the only mentoring-specific item in, in the federal budget, strong congressional advocacy for this program is essential, and I was glad to see so many of my colleagues from both sides of the aisle joining Representative Feenstra and me uh, uh, on our letter. So with help from Mentor, partner, Partners for Youth with Disabilities, and their allied organizations, Congress can close the mentorship gap and expand the inclusive mentoring movement. So I want to say thank you again for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the briefing. Wonderful. Um, so grateful for Rep. Langevin, uh, Rep. Langevin's remarks. Um, our next video is from Representative Don Young. Um, Mr. Young is from Alaska. In the video we're about to see, uh, uh, I'm sorry, he is also the co-chair of the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus. Don't want to forget that. Um, in the video we're about to see, um, Rep. Young is bearded. He's wearing a navy colored suit, a light blue shirt, um, he's wearing a polka dotted tie and he also wears glasses. He's sitting in front of a blue wall um, with photos and the congressional seal. Hello, this is Congressman Young, Don Young from the great state of Alaska. I want to thank the AAPD for inviting me to speak with you, which will not be long. But I want to stress the fact that, uh, where, frankly, I'm your friend. I'm the co-chairman of Disability Caucus, uh, a bipartisan institution that works with uh, people to try to help out legislation for the families and neighbors with disabilities are included in avenues of public life. It's important to remember that they be equipped with the skills necessary 
to succeed in the workplace. They're actually more dedicated, more, more, I say, true to the profession that they work for, and I'm big on it because I know the results of it because I've worked with them and know what happens and how much they, they appreciate, but not only that, how dedicated they are to do the job. Uh, they need a mentor, and very frankly, uh, somebody to back them up, too, and make sure that they understand they have friends and understand that they're being not only accepted, they know they can contribute, which is crucially important. Uh, again, in Congress, we have some legislation we pass, we forget the disabled. Uh, we have to make sure that doesn't happen and encourage, very, very frankly, the hiring and the availability of accessibility uh, and to buildings and every other form of what our nation is facing with. There's a plus side to this high technology. Uh, a lot of people can be very active now that weren't able to be done so before because technology has improved a great deal. So I'm very happy to be able to speak to you about your ability to take and be mentors, get mentors, understand and educate, and I'll help you. You've got a good friend in the, in the disability arena, and I am one that believes that it is probably one of the better con contributions we can make in Congress. So I'm happy that uh, I'm here. And remember, remember Don Young from the state of Alaska, the dean of the house, is a big supporter. God bless you all. Wonderful. It's always nice to have supporters, including Representative Young. Um, I, we're so grateful for both Mr. Langevin and Mr. Young joining us today and for the support of the Bipartisan uh, Disabilities Caucus, as well as the Youth Mentoring Caucus and Rep uh, Scanlon as well. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Sean Horn. Sean Horn is an advocate, the founder of Give Beauty Wings, a contributor to Ford, Forbes, excuse me, advisor to the National Disability Mentoring Coalition, and our MC for the rest of today's event. Welcome. Looks like you're muted, Sean. You might want to unmute. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited that I just got started. Um, okay, yes, thank you for that warm introduction. I'm Sean or Xi'an, as you mentioned. I'm wearing red and I've got long brown hair. I'm Chinese and Jewish, or as I like to say, Jewish. Um, I wouldn't be here today without uh, the support and mentorship of so many people. And I believe that the reason I'm able to support the men mentees that I have is because of the love that was poured into me and, and the belief that people had in me. So it's wonderful to support the next generation and see more funding and resources go to this. Um, I'm gonna keep this short since we are um, tight for time. I have to introduce a wonderful lady. I've gotten the pleasure to get to know as a board member of NDMC, uh, Regina Snowden is the founder and executive director of Partners for Youth with Disabilities. Uh, over to you, Regina. Thank you, Sean. How enthusiastic you are, and I am too. This is a day maker for me. Uh, thank you to Representative uh, Scanlon, Langvin, and Young. We appreciate your leadership on the National Mentoring Caucus and the Disability Caucus and your support on advancing inclusive mentoring. I am a white woman with kind of long blonde hair. I'm wearing a light blue shirt and I'm wearing glasses. I am the executive director of PYD. Uh, why PYD? When I was growing up with a per, as a person with a non-apparent disability I, in the 70s, 60s, coming into uh, that wonderful era of rights and justice issues, that was my forte. And I, through my social work degree, began working with youth that were at-risk youth. Because at that time, when you worked with young people, it was primarily always at-risk youth. I would receive requests for, from parents and resources of looking for opportunities for youth with disabilities and would be turned, these youth would be turned away. They couldn't find a mentoring program where they could be included. And I was working in mentoring and thought, why not in, include these youth in my program? And as I heard their stories, and as I heard the mentor stories, it resonated with me. They all talked about, every one of the mentors said, I did not grow up with anyone with a disability that I could identify with. I thought I was the only one. And I thought I, thought I was the only one. Oh, my, mine was hidden. And I, I thought I was the only one who was experiencing this. Um, 
in my school classroom regarding a learning disability. And I, I resonated. I felt like I'd really found a group of individuals that had to do a lot of bootstrapping and were doing it then through the civil rights acts that they put forth around uh, the disability community. And as I connected these young people with mentors, I discovered I had tapped a huge unmet need. Um, I knew that youth, these many, many youth could benefit from these mentors. PYD has served thousands of youth with disabilities through mentoring, through group mentoring, peer mentoring, and more recently, our e-mentoring opportunities. Original mentees in the 80s and 90s are now successfully experiencing careers, family life, independent living, community service. I went to an event yesterday that included those youth now in their 40s. And there they were, so many of them all together. And I was just amazed. I would have never imagined 35 years ago that I would see these youth this many years later and what they're doing and how they're thriving. And PYD has grown to be a national organization and is the home of NDMC. We're so proud and thankful. We continue to serve youth and young people with disabilities, adults with disabilities, while supporting organizations and becoming more inclusive and replicating PYD. Uh, uh, we have a lot, a, a variety of program models to replicate, including school-based mentoring, community-based mentoring, arts-based mentoring. Our NDMC network partners are operating innovative, scalable models, but we need more programs, more communities to reach our youth. We seek to expand with technical assistance and support to more organizations, all implementing quality mentoring programs with resources that are already available. Ed Minnesueto from NDMC will explain our policy and our programs and our priorities towards the end of our briefing. Disability is common and present in every community. One in four persons have a disability. We are really everyone. We're not a special group or a group that lives in one community or one language primarily. We are cross-cultural, cross socioeconomic status. One in seven youth are involved with the court system, have a disability, and no doubt that is one of the reasons they're within the juvenile justice system because of often unseen neurological disabilities. Disability is leveraging our disability programming we're leveraging mentoring in an inclusive strategy to high potential to positively impact all of our communities we are a universal community we have much work to do and we appreciate um, the mentoring and disability communities working together to increase and access to mentoring and roles through accessibility and inclusive mentoring models. This is a dream day for me because since I began PYD over and over, I would be asked, how can we have this in my community? And I would think, how? I'm just trying to begin it in Boston. And 35 years later, here we are together today, all of us talking together and joining force to bring inclusive mentoring nationally. PYD and MDMC, are continuing to work with our wonderful mentor, Inc., who is a vibrant and inclusive resource through David and his passion and uh, to expand our disability mentoring coalition. I want to thank my colleague, David Shapiro at Mentor Inc. and Maria Town at AAPD for their leadership, their strong leadership and their passion. I'm excited um, to learn now from Maria about her mentor and mentee pair today. Uh, these are voices that will guide all of us to build a more inclusive and mentoring community for the nation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Regina. First of all, I wanna say you're a great example of 
you know, in order for us to um, be a part of the solution, when we don't see something, we can create it. And you're an incredible ally and you have been since I believe I heard uh, 1985. So thank you for your decades of dedication. And with that, I share your enthusiasm for Miss Maria Town. We actually know each other since she was queen of something called a blog called CP Shoes. Then she was uh, part of MOPD for the city of Houston, um, Texas. And so I just wanted to say uh, cheers to my friend, the CEO and president of AAPD. Maria, we Thank have you. Thank you so much, John. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Maria Town. I am a white woman with shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing red lipstick and a light pink floral patterned dress. Um, first, I, I want to thank everybody who has come together to put on this briefing, our congressional hosts, our organizational partners, PYD, NDMC, and Mentor Inc. Um, I think as everybody has demonstrated, mentoring often takes a village to establish and sustain. And I think you'll hear a lot about that from my two co-panelists, Hamza Jaka and Lou, Lou Panicoli. Um, Hamza and Lou are both participants and alumni of AAPD's summer internship program where we place um, students and recent graduates with disabilities from across the country into internships in uh, congressional offices, federal agencies, and nonprofits, mostly located in DC. In addition to that placement, we also pair each intern with an individual mentor based on their interests and identities. Um, this is just one of the programs that AAPD has to support mentoring, particularly of uh, youth and young leaders with disabilities. Um, and I hope that you will go to our website, www.aapd.com to find out more about all the work that we do. Um, so right now I wanna bring Hamza and Lou into the conversation. Uh, Hamza and Lou, tell us a little bit about how you know each other. And in, in doing that, um, can you talk a little bit about the experiences you had with mentoring before the two of you were connected via AAPD? Well, for me, I know Hamza because I was connected to Hamza through the AAPD and working both with Hamza and with my prior mentor, Justice, has been a truly enriching and rewarding experience. I have, I, it's truly been very fortunate to have both of these amazing individuals guide me on my journey in disability advocacy and as a disability rights activist. Um, I both of these mentorships are virtual due to the ongoing pandemic. So I think it is rewarding at the, at the most. And my experience has been very, very good. I, I've met a lot of people, have had a lot of resources and have gotten up as far as I have through the help of AAPD and mentors like Hamza Janka and my prior mentor, Justice Shorter. So uh, first of all, thank you, Lou, for starting us off. I know that's always a challenge. Um, so I will say that I am coming full circle. When I was an AAPD intern, oh gosh, 10 years ago now, yeah. in 2011, um, I was paired up with a wonderful mentor by the name of Lawrence Carter Law. Um, and I met a number of wonderful uh, mentors throughout my time in DC, including Maria Town, who was one of my very first supervisors. Um, and I'll say that, you know, the thing that I appreciated about the mentorship that this organization provided was that it was one of the first times, and this is something we'll discuss a little bit later in the panel, it was one of the first times where I got to decide for myself what types of things I wanted to do with my life. A lot of mentoring before was, you know, do this, check this out. Um, and I was very fortunate in the years prior to AAPD and especially while working with AAPD 
to have mentors that started to ask me the question of what is it that you want to do with your life? And that led to me becoming an attorney um, and doing a lot of other cool things that I'm happy to share with Lou. Being a mentor is it's definitely a reminder not to project yourself onto the mentee you're working with and to support them in achieving their goals. Thank you so much, Lou and Hamza. And Hamza, I, I totally agree with you. This feels very full circle. Um, I think when we met, I was just starting out in my career and you were just starting out in, in college and we both learned a lot from each other, um, which is how mentoring should work. It's a two-way way street. And so building off of some of the things you both have said, uh, you've highlighted the, the benefit of not only having access to mentoring as people with disabilities, but also the benefit of having disabled mentors. Um, can you talk about some things that create barriers to a positive mentoring experience? And Hamza, you, you've mentioned some of these already, but we'll start with you and then go to Lou. Yeah, so I think a big barrier can be um, really not knowing where to start. Um, as we've talked about and we'll talk about, um, it's not always easy to be a mentor when you haven't had a lot of experience with people supporting you, as a lot of uh, disabled people, in particular multiply marginalized disabled people and other multiply marginalized communities face. Um, another big one is it's honestly hard to find uh, resources and thankfully that's changing due to the great work of AAPD, PYD, Mentor National. But those are the kinds of barriers that come up along with um, people with disabilities often being expected to do one or two particular things. Lou, how about you? What are um, what would you identify as some barriers to positive mentoring experiences? For me, some positive, some barriers. Well, I ha I've been very fortunate not to have a negative mentor experience, but some barriers that I would identify is the lacking of making the first move, the lacking of taking of the initiative, which I think is a result of anxiety and apprehensive for either party with making that first move because you're meeting this other individual on the other side for the first time you don't know him or her or they and you don't know him her or their personalities so i think with that being said it's and sometimes you are so overly subconscious about oh my god what if i say the wrong thing what if this happens what if and so it creates this hesitation inside of you to really initiate that conversation. But I believe once you surmount that hesitation, it's truly a rewarding and blossoming experience as, as it, for any individual. Thank you. And yeah, when I think about my own experiences with mentors, um, I, I find that there are two people who typically act as mentors, especially in communities that are historically marginalized. There are folks, um, and I will put myself in this category, who feel so unbelievably lucky and grateful that they had access to mentors, that they want to make sure other people have access to those same opportunities. And then there are other folks who understand what it's like to have to navigate life, work, and community without a connection to a mentor. And they wanna make sure that no one experiences that. And I think um, to, to both of your points, part of what we need to do to end this dynamic um, is to create a culture where mentoring of everyone, but particularly uh, young people who are multiply marginalized and who may experience barriers to education or the workforce, um, have an expectation of mentorship. Because the thing that brings those two groups of people together, those who have had some access to mentoring and those who've had none, um, but who continue to mentor today, is that they, they understand that, that getting access to mentoring is not the norm, nor is what's expected in their communities. Um, and so what 
what are some things that we can do, uh, Hamza and Lou, to make sure that um, mentor we develop a culture of mentoring across the United States and a culture where mentoring <clears throat> of multiply marginalized youth is expected? And I, I, I'll have us remember we're at a congressional briefing. So what would you tell policymakers and advocates to do to create this culture? So um, one thing that I would encourage you to do is continue to support um, wonderful programs like the work we owe the Workforce Initiatives and Opportunities Act um, that provide funding for mentoring um, and also support acts like the Foster uh, Mentoring Foster Youth or uh, Mentoring for Success Act and. I would also say that one of the things that you have to realize, and I really appreciate that the latest bills that are before Congress um, include a focus on evidence-based practice, right? Collecting data, gathering information, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Uh, because one of the things that often happens in mentoring relationships, particularly cross-cultural mentoring relationships is there isn't always a cultural competency that exists, right? There isn't a knowledge of our life experiences being different from other people that we work with, including our mentors. And I will say, one of the great uh, memories of my mentorships is that I've been mentored by lots of disabled people of color, and in particular, disabled women of color or disabled non-binary folks of color and that has made a huge difference in my life, but it's also been great to have mentors of other backgrounds who understand and accept the systemic barriers that multiply marginalized people like myself face and say, here is what I'm working to, here's how I'm working to change things. And that is the kind of mentor that we should um, focus on helping create and I think the way you do that is by doing in part what, you, what we've started with these uh, acts and why we're here today, focus on evidence-based practice and really, really work to create listings of mentors who have cross-cultural competence. I'm, Go ahead. Oh, I would fully agree with everything Hamza just said wholeheartedly. And I think the expansion of diversity within a mentorship coalition is important because we know mentors and mentees are coming from all different demographic backgrounds, especially the disability community, which is both intersectional and broad, which we really need to fixate on developing a coalition and a program of sorts that could really focus on mentoring as a whole with a focus on mentoring youth with disabilities. So that is definitely a, a priority that we need in order to really get the ball rolling with this mentorship coalition and especially offering training programs and possibly paid opportunities to develop the next generation of peer mentoring in and outside of the disability community. Thank you so much for your insights. Oh, Hamza, did you have something to add? I was going to just say that um, one of the important things to uh, remember is that mentoring is often provided by folks who are already from multiply marginalized communities. So I think compensating individuals who are already doing that work, particularly those who provide mentoring as a service, is really important and we need to take steps to capture that knowledge and utilize it. Amen. <laughs> um, so I we've got just a few more minutes and I want to get through two, two questions. Um, Hamza, you and Lou have been paired in a virtual mentoring setting and I think often we think about mentoring that is in person face to face can, um, can you talk about, uh, both you and Lou, your experiences in a virtual mentoring relationship and what implications you think virtual mentorship holds for the field? Hello? 
Sorry, I was on mute for a little longer than I wanted to be. Um, I think that virtual mentoring is a very powerful tool. Um, I know that when I was in certain programs, including APD, it was very geographically focused. And I think that virtual mentoring can allow for an expansion of mentoring programs. Um, and I think it can also make it easier to connect. Uh, I do feel though that virtual mentoring requires some more intentionality, um, right? Because sometimes a lot of mentoring events, they're already set. Like, oh, let's go out for dinner and let's talk about work or something like that. With virtual mentoring, it's kind of helpful to set an agenda. And I think once you start to develop a rapport, like, I don't know, Lou, I feel like you've called me a couple of times where we've just talked for a few hours. Once you develop that rapport, you can have that conversation, but it takes a little more to build that rapport when you are doing virtual mentoring. I do, and I think that the phone calls that you and I have had, Hamza, has been beneficial <laughs> for on both on both ends. Definitely, I think that the phone calls are good, a, a good way of building rapport or possibly video chat because it allows you to physically see the other person if the other person is comfortable, and that's a good way to build report in the virtual mentoring workplace if mentoring cannot be done in person because of, well, the current predicament we are in now. But I think that a key aspect is the rapport building. And I think telephone, regular correspondence via phone or video chat is two great ways to build rapport, especially if it's done on a regular, consistent basis. So I think that is a key element in rapport building uh, in the mentoring community and the development of mentorship programs. Okay, we've got one minute left. So I'm gonna ask my final question, which is really a big one. Um, Lou, why don't you just uh, help close us out and share any final thoughts you have on mentoring and hopes you have for the advancement of inclusive mentoring across the United States. And then Hamza, I'll ask you the same question. My hopes and dreams when it comes to mentoring is to have truly an, an AmeriCorps Peace Corps version of mentoring in the United States that could we really have a national or federal program that is based fully on peer mentoring or professional mentoring of underrepresented communities, especially the disability community in and of itself. I hope that we could develop a workforce, a professional workforce of trained peer mentors with disabilities. It would, not also, it would not only generate employment, it would generate economic revenue, and it would give, most importantly, it would give people the benefit to have that guidance in their lives if they can uh, receive that guidance and advisement from perhaps a relative or a trusted friend. They would have that external relationship that they develop to assist them in the professional and personal development. And I also think Men, the mentor, mentorships need to be not necessarily catered, but really focused on the disability community because let's face it, how much opportunities are there out there for so many other demographics, but not necessarily for the disability community, even though the disability community intersects every single demographic that there is. So I think really a, fix, a fixation on diversity, inclusivity, and equity is essential for the development of this peer mentorship program career program. Yeah. And as for, as for my thoughts, if I can share really quick. Um, Great minds think alike, Hamza. Uh, I do agree with Lou, but I wanna say that I think we're, what I wanna see is mentoring for everybody, right? Mentoring that is catered toward everyone because everyone deserves a mentor. Um, you know, a lot of folks with different types of disabilities don't get access or a lot of folks who are swept up in the criminal justice system, their lives are, they're, they're, they don't have access to mentors and access to resources, and their lives are not um, supported in the ways that they need to be. And I think programs like AAPD, PYD, NDMC really do a great job of starting to get us there. I wanna make sure that we can get there and stay there and build something that changes the world. 
That's an amazing note to end on. Thank you, Hamza, and thank you, Lou, and I'll turn the program back to you, Sean. Ah, uh, Maria, Lou, Hamza, so many gems. Obviously, we're short for time, but I just wanted to say I'm so happy that intersectionality is being talked about and um, catering to everyone. And I just wanted to emphasize, uh, Maria mentioned support systems. And one of the reasons that I started Give Beauty Wings my self-esteem program is I wanted to be the love and support that I received as a child. I believe, and I have believed that my disability was a blessing because I had the right support systems and I had parents who believed anything was possible. And so I thought to myself, how can we make sure that, you know, obviously we can't control necessarily if we are born into the right school districts or have um, you know, supportive parents. So I just want to encourage everyone who's listening that we can be that love and support for others. Um, and with that, and it doesn't matter if you have a disability, everyone can be an ally. So I just wanted to emphasize Maria's point because it's so powerful. And with that, I want to introduce uh, a man that I've heard so much about and he, his uh, reputation precedes him, Jim Warren, owner and president of Warrior Society Development and USD Center for Disability. Welcome, Jim. Ah, thank you so much. And mitakiwe oyase, and in my Oglala Lakota language, that means uh, we are all related. So greetings to my relatives out there that are um, passionate about our young generation and mentorship for our young ones with disability. I want to share some of my Oglala perspectives Oglala Lakota is my tribe. Americans know us more as the Sioux Nation, but I prefer what we call ourselves for thousands of years. So uh, the Oglala Lakota perspective, uh, first of all, I'm a classic definition of a big and tall person. So I'm 6'7", 300 plus pounds, I'll just say. But uh, I'm a native person, I have long hair, my hair is getting gray now, so I like to call them knowledge highlights versus getting old. Um, but uh, this is a reality for me as a, a big person uh, having an unusual experience in a world made for smaller people. So that's an unusual perspective as a big and tall person. I'm here in uh, the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas for the Reservation Economic Summit. And we actually have a youth group here of young entrepreneurs sharing their business ideas. And it's a wonderful example of mentorship here at the Reservation Economic Summit. I'm presenting later today regarding Indian country business development. My mentor was my dad, Jim Sr. He had MS for uh, 37 years. So uh, he uh, uh, contracted MS while I was in high school and uh, Initially, obviously, it was a great change for the family as he progressed and started using a wheelchair. And as you know, that it's a progressive disease and more disability aspects are a result. But I saw true strength. I saw an example of a person that would spend two hours just getting from bed to the bathroom and get dressed just so he could go to work in his uh, scooter that he used at the time. So what a wonderful experience as a young person to see that not only as a father, but an example of what you can do to face great challenges. Unfortunately, Indian country, we have the highest rate of disability than any other cultural group in the United States. I work with a lot of tribal VR programs and section 21 of the Rehabilitation Act identifies American Indians as the highest rate of disability and the lowest rate of services. So there is a great need in Indian country, particularly reservation communities that are usually rural, isolated and have high poverty. Um, a lot of the reality of the disability culture and native culture is I see similarities and a parallel between the cultures because I say that we're often forgotten in Congress or in uh, national perspectives that people with disabilities as well as indigenous members, Native American people are often left out or forgotten or not even addressed. So that's something where I see that the both cultures have a great responsibility to mentor and guide our young ones so that they are the future warriors, if you will. My company, Warrior Society Development, many people think of warrior only in the physical 
sense, in a guardian sense, but a true warrior is someone that represents their people in a good way, their family in a good way. They are good parents and uh, nurturers and mentors as a natural part of their uh, responsibility to the tiyoshpae, in my language, to the community, to the people. So uh, from an indigenous perspective, the reality of Indian country is we really need to have more disability mentor examples. As mentioned previously, and I like people mentioning the generations and examples, uh, I'm considered a mentor because of my experience in Indian country. And that's why I'm able to provide some of my perspectives as an elder in training. I like to say I'm 56 now, so I'm getting to that elder status in Indian country, which is very important. But our sacred beings, our young ones, our uh, Takoja as my grandkids are sacred beings. And I want them to have a better world in future generations. And providing examples of the warrior philosophies uh, balanced within the medicine wheel and the emotional, mental, physical, spiritual context. And of course, when we want to address some of the systemic issues, it's really uh, difficult. I mentioned poverty, Pine Ridge, my home reservation, uh, is the poorest county in the United States. So it's under 10,000 a year for families income. We have the highest rate of suicide, youth suicide. Back home at Pine Ridge, there's a young person attempting suicide every day in Pine Ridge. And many of them are not successful, fortunately, but they end up with a disability. And obviously they're dealing with emotional and mental disabilities because they're at that point in their life. And accident services, Indian Health Service, is funded at 60% capacity. So obviously we have the highest mortality rates. The average lifespan for Indian men in South Dakota is 54. So we have the lowest life expectancy rate, highest uh, suicide rates. Obviously mentorship is important and we must address our future generations, not only from an indigenous view, but from a two-legged human view on how can we plant the seeds for these young ones so that they can have the success and inclusion that all of us deserve as human beings in this country. So thank you so much for allowing me to share an indigenous view of mentorship and disability. We are all related. Thank you, my relatives. Jim, thank you so much. Let us know how we can support you, please. I think what you mentioned, you know, we can say mentoring is a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do. But you, you highlighted the fact that for so many, uh, it is life and death. So I hope everybody really took in what Jim had to say. And uh, with that, I really can't wait to uh, introduce my friend and fellow um, uh, serving on the board of advisors with me at NDMC, Edmund Asiedu, policy analyst for accessibility and disability services facilitator for the Department of Transportation. Edmund, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sean, uh, for the short introduction. And also thanks to uh, the Youth Mentoring and uh, Disabilities Caucus uh, leaders for your comment and support. Um, growing up as a young person uh, in Ghana, in the western part of Africa, um, as a teenager, you know, growing up in a village, I was once, you know, witnessed, um, you know, a gentleman who came to my village just to educate people with disabilities on their rights. And as a, as a teenager, you know, with a disability, I got, you know, enticed and excited about seeing someone with a disability, someone who looked like me coming to tell me that, oh, I have some rights. Therefore, this person ended up becoming my role model. And I kept looking up to, you know, to him um, for quite some time. That led to me, you know, getting that internal motivation to go to the national level to compete for a position with the Ghana National Association of uh, you know, the Physically Disabled Youth Wing as a public relations officer. I grew up around this person, this role model, later on became my mentor and impacted my whole career. I ended up coming to the United States around 2010. Here I am as a citizen of the United States 
working in accessibility and civil rights, uh, uh, um, you know, fighting for accommodations and access for individuals with disabilities. Um, you know, arriving in America, I also ended up having a mentor uh, whose name is Dick Trump. Dick Trump is the founder of the Achilles International or Achilles Track Team. And Dick Trump really impacted my life in a wonderful way because as a young person, as an immigrant with disability and him being a person with a disability, he took his time to tell me so much that I didn't know. That would have taken me years and years uh, to know. I followed the steps that this person introduced me to and I became successful and I am still successful. So access to role models with disabilities for people with disabilities is very critical. Access to role models and mentors for youth is also very critical. That is why we support the Mentoring to Success Act and Foster Youth Mentoring Act. As an advisor of the National Disability Mentoring Coalition, I also want to draw your attention to the need to advance inclusive mentoring practices. This is why Mentor and NDMC are collaborating on NDMC's Disability Mentoring Certification Program, which provided its first ever training this year we need to expand this certification program to increase accessibility and practices of mentoring programs across the nation. We also call for the National Mentoring Resource Center to increase provision of technical assistance and connecting with the ADA National Network, bringing more disability accessibility subject matter expertise to the resource center. For our third priority, we seek to build a paid peer mentoring workforce for young adults with disabilities. In this model, funding through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, we use a best practice model already operating in the state of Florida with peer mentoring works, certified participants, and expanded across the nation. Let's get young people paid work experience while also having them serve as role models and mentors in their communities across the nation. Our fourth and final priority is to increase access to accessible e-mentoring solutions. We learned during the pandemic that social isolation is harmful for us all. We have known this for years about our disabled community. We request e-mentoring you know, be included as a category in the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Mentoring Programs Initiative to expand access to mentoring. Thank you for your time and for your willingness to increase access and opportunities for young people with disabilities like myself um, and everyone else who have spoken today via inclusive mentoring. If you are interested in joining us in this work, please consider joining the National Disability Mentoring Coalition at www.disabilitymentors.org. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Edmund. I, I, I love seeing you at offline for once, but also I wanna thank you. You know, uh, with COVID, I think we all now understand what isolation feels like, but you know, for many people with disabilities, this is not just COVID times, this is their everyday life. So mentoring is even more important. Thank you for sharing your story, Edmund. And we're short on time. Thank you guys for, um, you know, who have stayed uh, with us. I, with that, I'm going to uh, give it back to the wonderful Abby, Abby Evan. Back to you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sean. This is Abby. Um, uh, Edmund made my wrap up very, very easy. He's so perfectly articulated. All of our collective uh, policy priorities, uh, as you may have seen, Caden just dropped into the chat that we will be sending out a document that clearly articulates those four uh, policy priorities. So everyone on this call will receive that. The only thing I think I will add to that, just as an FYI, particularly for congressional staff who are still with us, um, is that with WIOA reauthorization coming up, it's been mentioned a couple of times in this panel, um, we know this is a perfect opportunity to really um, drive home 
the importance of mentoring and peer support um, and developing that peer that paid peer network. So um, we're still working on what some of those priorities would look like. We would love to talk to interested congressional offices about that. So please reach out to myself or to Caden or to really anyone on this call. They'll make sure we connect. Um, and uh, one other thing I wanted to flag for you is that um, we will be having another one of these conversations. The National Disabilities Mentoring Coalition is hosting uh, an event with Mentor and with AAPD and with the mentoring and disability communities on September 23rd. Um, and we hope that you can join us then. More information about that is coming. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions and please have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so much.